In this video lecture, we're going to look at an overview of the digestive system, pretty much covering some of the basics of the structure and functioning of the digestive system. So that's going to include what are the processes that are included in the digestion, what are the tissue layers um, along the digestive tract, and then finally looking at um, the control of the digestive system functioning through either an extrinsic nervous system, that would basically be our autonomic nervous system, more specifically the parasympathetic nervous system, and then the enteric nervous system, or if you think enteric, think internal, so it's an internal nervous system, the digestive system, it's got its own little brain, so to speak. So let's first look at the digestive tract. The digestive tract is also called the gastrointestinal tract, or GI tract, or alimentary canal. This is basically any of the tube-like organs that the food is going to pass through that would be considered part of the digestive tract. So this picture down here shows all the parts of the digestive tract, including the mouth, the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, anus. Those would all be part of the digestive tract, okay, because the food passes through it. The um, pancreas, though, is not part of the digestive tract. It is actually an accessory organ. So these are all the organs that help with the digestive process that are, are essential to the digestive process, um, but they're not where the food is passing through a tube. So things like the teeth, the gallbladder, liver, the pancreas, all are part are accessory organs. Some of the digestive process, of course, includes ingestion, that is the eating food, taking it in. Um, as you can see here, this woman, I think she won the Buffalo Wing Challenge a year ago anyway. Um, then propulsion is another digestive process, two possible uh, ways that we see uh, propulsion. Peristalsis is one of those. These are wave-like contractions that push the food along. So here's our bolus of food or chunk of food. If contractions behind that will push it forward. And so these contractions just continue to wave on down and that pushes the food on through to other organs along the digestive tract. And then of course, swallowing down here is another process. It's another way to push food from your mouth down into your esophagus and then finally your stomach. Another way to look into the digestive process is the mechanical breakdown that's involved in digestion. Um, now realize mechanical breakdown is all it's doing is increasing surface area of the food. So it's taking big chunks of food and making them smaller and little bits, little teeny bits. This is not chemical uh, digestion. Chemical digestion means you're breaking chemical bonds. So we're gonna break that chemical digestion would take like polysaccharides and break it down into glucose or proteins and break it down to amino acids. That's chemical digestion. Here we're just making mechanical digestion. We're just taking um, big pieces and making them smaller. So there's still the carbohydrates are still carbohydrates. They're still polysaccharides are still polysaccharides. We haven't broken them down any smaller. So these are things like chewing, mixing, churning of the food, and finally segmentation. In segmentation, this is movement of the food not to propel it along like in peristalsis, but instead to churn the food and mix it to make it in smaller bits. So here, for example, you would contract right here in the middle of this brown chunk of food, and that would split it into two pieces. Or here, yellow, breaking it up in two pieces, and then you contract the muscles here to break into smaller pieces. So finally, you can see down here, everything's much smaller and the foods are mixed together more. Now we can go look at digestion. Digestion is the chemical breakdown of the food. So we're taking those large types molecules and digesting them into their smaller basic building blocks or monomers. So here, for example, carbohydrates like bread, break it down into the simplest um, of the molecules or the building blocks called monomers or monosaccharides in this case, which would be glucose, take proteins and break it down into amino acids, take fats and break it down into fatty acids. And then another, of course, now that we've got the food digested, uh, we need to absorb it into our uh, body so we can use those nutrients. So then the food has to move from the lumen of the digestive tract through the wall of the digestive tract and then either into our blood or lymphatic systems. Now lymphatic system or lymph is simply another transport system um, that we have through our body similar to the circulatory system but it doesn't have um, 
exactly the same type of composition. And we'll talk more about that um, as we go through these lectures. And then, of course, the last thing is that those food, the food that we can absorb, the stuff that simply isn't any good for us or, or we can't utilize, we have to get rid of. And so that means we have to defecate that food, um, which is basically eliminated for our body. So basically everyone poops. It's just one of my favorite books for my son and daughter when they were growing up. Another part of the digestive system that we have to look at is the coverings of the um, organs, and that's the serous membranes. You might have learned the serous membranes from your 107 class, um, but if not, that's all right. We'll look at them here. Now, serous membranes are mucus-producing uh, membranes to help lubricate the organs in that um, cavity. We have them around the heart, we have them around the lungs, and so we're going to now concentrate on the ones in the abdominal cavity. Um, and so by lubricating those organs, um, then they re you reduce friction so that when they're moving around, you don't have a buildup of friction and then can damage the, the walls of those organs. So now in the peritoneum, we have two layers, the visceral peritoneum. The visceral peritoneum is those layers of the serous membranes that cover the organs directly here, you can see along here. The parietal peritoneum is the part of the peritoneum that covers the wall of the abdominal cavity. And then what's unique to the abdominal cavity in the serous membranes is the mesentery. The mesentery is a double thick wall of serous membranes here. You can see it here, a little bit there, a little bit here. So those are, again, double thick wall of um, serous membranes. The idea of the mesentery is to provide a route for blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and nerves to get to each organ. So that way they have a sub structural support to run those blood vessels out, take, say here for the colon. Instead, if we didn't have that, those blood vessels would just kind of have to hang in the abdominal cavity like a electric wire um, or a telephone wire between telephone poles. That's not very protective. It would be easy for those to be damaged. So having the mesentery gives a route for those blood vessels and nerves to, to travel. Another thing that the mesentery does is helps hold the organs in place. You've got a lot of organs. If you think the small intestine, you've got a lot of, of undulating um, tube going through there, so it needs to be held in place. And then last thing the mesentery does is stores fat. Now, not every organ in the abdominal cavity is covered with serous membranes. Some of them are what is called retroperitoneal. Now, if you think of the term retro, if someone is retro, that means they're kind of behind the times. So retroperitoneal is behind the peritoneum. And so you can see here, for example, the pancreas is behind the peritoneum. Notice it's not covered with visceral peritoneum. It's just right behind the parietal peritoneum. Other organs that are retroperitoneal are the duodenum, part of the small intestine, parts of the large intestine here and there, um, and then the kidney, although the kidney, of course, is not part of the digestive system. A couple disorders associated with the serous membranes. One is ascites. Ascites is an abdominal swelling due to accumulation of fluid. We'll talk more about this um, when we do the cardiovascular system. And then the peritonitis, which is inflammation of the peritoneum, usually because of an infection. Uh, we see this with an appendicitis if it ruptures all the contents inside the appendix ends up spewing into the abdominal cavity that often um, of, is going to include bacteria and therefore you can get a, a pretty serious infection within the abdominal cavity from it. Now layers of the digestive tract um, include four layers. The innermost layer is called the mucosa. This is a moist epithelial tissue lining the canal um, or the lumen of the um, digestive tract. So this would be the lumen. So you can see here in the pink is the mucosa. The mucosa has three layers to it. The epithelial layer is the um, innermost layer. This is either stratified squamous or columnar epithelial. 
Underneath that is the lamina propria. This is a loose connective tissue. It contains capillaries, lymphatics for protection from invading organisms. Um, lymphatic system, again, is, is a circulatory system that includes a lot of white blood cells and is part of our immune system. Um, then underneath that is a muscle layer or called the muscularis mucosa. This is smooth muscle, just a small little layer of smooth muscle. It's not going to be used for peristalsis or move or segmentation, either moving stuff along or mixing things. Instead, the idea of this muscularis mucosa or muscle layer is simply to shake the food off of the um, digestive tract wall, kind of like if you shook your hand to shake water off of it. Okay. Also, it's uh, used to help make folds, small folds to in the along the inside of the digestive tract to help increase surface area. We'll see that when we look particularly at the uh, small intestine. Uh, functions in the mucosa, of course, is to secrete mucus and digestive enzymes and hormones uh, to help with the digestive process. Of course, it's a, to help absorb uh, diet foods um, that we eat. And then finally, of course, it's to protect us from the nasty bacteria that we have inside the food and the lumen that would be contained within the lumen. The next layer then is the submucosa. The submucosa is a layer of connective tissue um, that's rich in blood supply and lymphatic vessels and nerve fibers that feed into the lamina propria of the mucosa. And then it also has the nerve, one of the nerve plexus, that enteric nerve plexus. Again, this is just a little nervous system for the digestive system itself. Then we have the muscularis externa layer. This is the large smooth muscle layer. It consists of two layers of smooth muscles in most of the digestive tract. Notice the longitudinal muscle layer and a circular muscle layer. And again, this is going to be for the segmentation and peristalsis action to help either mix the food or move the food along, um, along the digestive tract. And then the last layer is going to be the serosa, which is basically the same thing as the visceral peritoneum. Okay, so now let's look at that enteric nervous system. The um, enteric nervous system, as I said, is like the brain of the nervous system, or excuse me, brain of the uh, digestive system. Sometimes it's called the gut brain. It again consists of nerve plexes, just a network of, of nerves that are, that are connected from one part of the digestive tract to another. So this would be these referred to as these short reflexes so that if the, some stimuli hits the GI tract of some kind, maybe distension of the stomach wall or their chemoreceptor sensing chemicals, osmoreceptor sensing how hypertonic or hypotonic it is, something that stimulates it instead of going all the way up to the brain and come back this short reflex or enteric nervous system is going to get the um, just directly connect to the effectors, the smooth muscle or glands, and therefore get a response. So maybe it'll be secreting a hormone, or maybe there'll be contraction of the smooth muscles to for churning and, and um, mechanically digesting up the food, um, say in your stomach. Now at the same time though, we still use the long reflexes, that is our central nervous system reflexes. So those same uh, receptors that pick up that stimuli are going to also send impulses through long reflexes, that sensory neurons, up to the central nervous system, and there in turn the nervous system then sends efferent or motor fibers um, signals to the same nerve plexus and get an effect as well. So remember this is autonomic functioning. This is the para, often parasympathetic system that's going to affect our little uh, gut brain here. So both of these are going to go on at the same time. We're going to have short reflexes that are immediate, that are built in, just quick response there, as well as we're going to have long reflexes going through the central nervous system, again causing smooth muscle or glands to have their effect on the digestive system. External things or stimuli can also be brought into that. The idea that when you think about food or you smell food, instantly you start salivating, right? You think, just think chocolate chip cookies. Ah, 
everybody's mouth should be watering by now um, because that is an external stimuli through the central nervous system and autonomic if um, autonomic nervous system sending impulses to the salivary glands getting you to salivate would be an example of that route here. Okay, okay that ends our video lecture for this portion. The next uh, video lecture then is going to be talking about just the functional anatomy of the digestive system. We're going to go mouth to stomach and then another future um, video will go pick up from the stomach and go look at the large and small intestines.